All right. Hello, folks. Uh, happy 4th of July for those of you who are celebrating. Um, today's uh, stream, I'm going to be working on uh, the supermarket checkout pricer exercise that I did last time. Uh, but whereas last time I started from the sort of a bit inside out, sort of starting directly with um, the cart and figuring out the product pricing and tracking the products. Uh, it was a bit awkward because there were some places there that it was unclear where was the information coming from. So uh, let's take a look at where we were and then uh, then we'll start over. So let's go over here. Um, <clears throat> Let me update this. And let's go and check out Arg. Come on, IntelliJ. Ugh, so frustrating. Um, let's do this. Nope, that didn't help. Let's close the project and try again. <laughs> hey, you. Tell Jay, I don't know why it had a problem. Like, I didn't change. Uh, I think the, oh, the JDK and the um, main branch might be different. Uh, all right, let's close that and reopen it. Okay, so now it works. Uh, let's make sure we're back on 18. Hey, Suiji. All right. So, um, last time uh, we had gotten to the point where in our tests we had um, the ability to not only price the items, but also be able to ask for the cart contents and find out uh, what they what they contained, uh, and we had extracted a product as base as just a straightforward record. Um, but what started to become unclear was when I wanted to separate the responsibilities around this um, receipt printer. Uh, basically, I split out the code so that the scanner printer was responsible for um, printing the receipt. So we'd done that separation, um, but was really kind of awkward. Be and again, mainly because we weren't doing outside in, we were starting with this cart thing and then expanding from there. Uh, but the real question is where, like, wh how does this whole application start? What triggers products to be added to the cart? what information comes in uh, to the cart? Like, does it just get products added? If so, then where do those products come from? In our tests, we basically create these products manually, but those products we're instantiating each time. And so anybody could, you know, if this were something with, uh, you know, type in the name of your product and, and the price, that would be really inefficient. Right, that's not something we'd we'd want to want to deliver, and so this is really um, while the the sort of standard checkout pricer exercise is is mainly around just getting the product stuff to work, right? Getting all of the different options around, um, uh, you know, the special deals and and things like that. 
Um, I'm a bit more interested because I'm uh, wanting to create more examples for my hexagonal architecture course. I'm really more interested in, in doing this from, from the outside in. Uh, so you do play around with the pre-printer extract and try renaming cart to receipt printer and extracting the duplicate cart. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you could do that. Um, and so I wanted to sort of start over and uh, take it from how, you know, thinking a, a bit more about how does the information come in? Uh, what's interesting is that uh, this then allows that um, this to be more of a hexagonal architecture application than just sort of, you know, uh, having a cart that knows how to do special deals and, and things like that. Um, I think it's actually, I think it's more interesting mainly because it, it, it has to do with hexagonal architecture, which, which of course, if you know that that's something I'm very interested in. Um, but I think it also, uh, is more realistic. Um, and there's not enough good examples of, of hexagonal architected applications. Uh, even though this will still be a relatively toy application, I think it'll have a lot of the um, uh, things that we want. Um, so, sorry, I'm just getting my drawing tool up. So I'm experimenting with um, using my iPad as my drawing tool because I have my Apple Pencil. Uh, so let's see how that works. Okay. Um, so what um, what we're doing here, let me just minimize some other windows. Okay. So what we want is is things like cart, um, and product, we want uh, those things to be part of our domain and have no knowledge of sort of where, where information came from. What we want to get to is where we're adding products which would have sort of price associated with it. Um, we want to get those products into the cart. So the question that arises, okay, how does the system, you know, let's say we're actually writing code for uh, a checkout scanner. Where does the information come from, right? How do we know what product was just selected to be added to the sort of the cart? Um, even if this weren't, you know, a physical checkout machine, the same thing applies. Like, where does the information come from? in terms of how the person selected selected the item. Oh, Swiggy, thanks for the for the sub with Prime Game. Appreciate that. Um, so the the answer is basically from from this adapter. So the adapter is the connection to the outside world, right? The stuff out here is pure Right, it, it has not, no knowledge of where the information came from. Is it a physical machine with a barcode scanner? Um, or is it uh, you're shopping online and you're clicking on items that are displayed on a, on a web page? Who knows? Who cares? That's all up to uh, this adapter. Hey, Dota Attitude. Oh, thanks for, for your 10 month sub. Wow. Oh, you can still take that shot. One zero months. It's either two months or ten months. Um, so, right, yes. Uh, and so the adapter um, then becomes, okay, what do we want our adapter to be? Uh, <clears throat> what I think um, might be interesting is that it's coming in from some barcode scanner. And so uh, the reason why I, I sort of want to go that direction is because then there's going to be the need to go to some other system
to look up uh, to look up APIs uh, to, to look up UPCs via a, an API. So there'd be basically an API call here to talk to uh, some server, and and I basically found one that that basically returns the name of the product along with a bunch of other information, but we won't need all that information. And so um, what we'll do is we'll want to map then uh, that product name to, to our catalog. Um, now we could say, well, why don't we just map the UPC in our catalog to the, to the name? Well, maybe we don't, um, we don't have all, all the information we need. So what'll basically uh, happen is is the um, UPC will will come in through the adapter. Uh, we'll have to go and fetch information from the from the external service, uh, and then we'll use that information to figure out which product we need to uh, to add to the cart. And so when, if, if that's what we've got, then, uh, you know, what might our first story be, right? So, um, what we want to build is, uh, where we get, you know, some, some UPC, you know, from barcoder for, from whatever, um, translate that into a, a product. So maybe we get that information, uh, from the third-party service, and then we we look it up in our um, repository. So maybe we have a product catalog. So we've got some product catalog to to find out what that information. Uh, around the products is. And so that means we'll need yet another way to access something externally. So this gives us enough of, enough of the bits and pieces for um, a hexog a, a, an application that would lend itself to hexagonal architecture, right? We've got our um, uh, our sort of barcode scanner here. Right, and then um, we've got our domain. It talks to the U UPC uh, external service out here. And then uh, we'll also want another adapter which will be the thing that uh, prints our receipts. So we've got an inbound adapter for the barcode. We've got some uh, information requester types of things where we're fetching information from the third party service. Right, that's our UPC uh, API. We've got our catalog to retrieve information about the the, um, the product itself, and then at some point we'll want to trigger uh, the receipt printer to, to print. No, there's a little lag because I'm I'm using um, uh, a shared whiteboard, um, so there's a slight lag. Uh, trying to figure out a, a better a better system. It'd be nice if like I could literally use the iPad as a drawing tablet. Um, but the only way to do that is, uh, some hacky stuff that, that doesn't work for me. Hey there, you muse, uh, what would be a good read to improve your TDD skills? Um, like most things you will not learn by reading, uh, you will learn by doing, but some guy, some good guidance, um, for TDD is, uh, I think Kent Beck's book is is okay for for starting out, but it, it's going to end at a point where you're just going to want to do more. Um, beyond that, 
I actually don't know of, uh, there's a book that, that, um, has a chapter on it. I have not looked at it, uh, to see if it's, to see how good it is. Um, so I'm not sure I can recommend any books other than Kent Beck's, which I think is, is okay as a grounding, but, uh, I don't think gets you to some of the more advanced stuff. Cause I think some of the more advanced stuff is actually, um, the kind of things that, that, um, I'm going to be walking through in terms of hexagonal architecture. So, uh, I would say basically try to follow the, the, the TDD things that, that Kent Beck talks about. Um, I think one of the hardest parts about TDD is actually the refactoring and that's, that's under emphasized. Uh, so getting good at refactoring, I think getting the refactoring book by Martin Fowler, uh, will, will help a lot. All right, so we've got, um, and of course, if you're not already in my Discord, uh, we talk a lot about TDD and hexagonal architecture and all sorts of stuff. So uh, don't hesitate to, to drop by and ask as you learn. All right, so we're going to basically um, go back to our uh, main branch. We're going to create a new branch. Um, and this one's going to be uh, hex arc. That was weird. I'm not sure why I didn't open the, both of those up. So, um, where, let's see where we start. Um, and by the way, speaking of TDD, like one of the things you want to do is, is exercises like the supermarket checkout pricer. Uh, so, um, the main branch for this is just these first tests to start with. And then, uh, the readme has a bunch of ideas for, for how to, uh, how to kind of kick that off. So something like that is, is a, is a really good, uh, place you know, sort of thing to play with. And, um, so we've kind of established like, where does, where do we start here? How does it know where the, um, product comes from? Uh, and so the question then is, is given this, you know, quick and dirty architecture diagram, uh, where do we start? Well, we want to start with, um, basically here All right with with our inbound adapter because that's going to be helping us figure out and this is why it's often called outside in development we're starting with the outside how does information get into the system so let's say um the upc code comes in um there's all sorts of questions around uh, if this is, you know, an online system, then we have to sort of know who's, who's the customer here because it's handling, you know, a bunch of different customers all at the same time, right? Any website that is, is going to need to do that. But if we kind of assume this is sort of a standalone machine, then we don't need to know that because the, there is only one, one user. So we can start there. Um, and then, uh, we could always explore what would it, take to have this be sort of an online online system hey homeless 207 uh barcos guys like yeah uh yeah i mean it may have a connection to to the internet um but it doesn't you know certainly especially the modern self-checkout ones uh where um it's also going to do things like you know you enter your membership number so you can get discounts and things like that uh, there's all sorts of complexity that we could add in, uh, but we're going to try try and keep it uh, fairly straightforward. But we are going to be connected to the internet because we are going to um, basically uh, call out to this third-party API to get information about the product. So 
So we'll start with the adapter, um, and uh, we don't necessarily need to start with the implementation of the adapter. Uh, so we can basically start with um, the UPC, yeah, universal product code. So we'll start with the UPC. I know we say it like ATM machine, right? Uh, we start with the UPC. That comes in as a number. Maybe it comes in as you know just a string. And so what do we do with that, right? So we're basically thinking about what comes in to the adapter, but in terms of where we might start, we're really going to start at, at this boundary, right? This is the boundary of, of sort of our application code, right? So what is, and, and basically what's there, what's at this boundary um, here, this is our, our application layer. All right, so this is the first thing that adapters connect to once they've done all their work of handling input and, and receiving messages and deciphering them and so on. Uh, this is the first layer they, they get to. And so this is why in hexagonal architecture, it's often called the use case layer. So if the use case layer, um, if the use case that we're talking about is uh, product scanned, right, add product, then we can start with our use case and have and start test driving from there. Yeah, sometimes it seems like deciphering. Deciphering, decoding, uh, whatever, whatever might need to happen. Um, so that means we're not gonna start with a cart test um, or at least <clears throat> not with an, with, uh, um, yeah, we're not going to use that word. So let's go ahead and, and delete this. Uh, we're on the branch. Yeah. So let's go ahead and delete this. And, um, what we're going to start with is, um, Start with an add product to cart test. Let's start off by putting this in, in the right layer. So we're going to put this in our um, application layer. And we'll go ahead and create that layer here. And so we'll start with our first test. So what would our first test be? Um, here, again, we're at the use case level. So our tip, my typical TDD uh, uh, sort of thought of where do I start, which is zombies, right? Zero, one, many, handling the zero case. Here, it's different because we're starting at a, a use case. So what the use case is, is add a product. Okay, so what product are we going to add? Um, kind of doesn't matter. Uh, we used toothbrush in, in the examples before, so we'll sort of continue with that. Hello, toothbrush. Um, so so the test is really um, it's add toothbrush, and so then what's our expectation? So uh, what we want is, how do we know this worked, right? So the two, sort of the hardest parts of test-driven development uh, is, is figuring out um, what do we want it to do? Okay, so we want to add a product. Well, how does that come in? What's sort of the, the API, as it were, at this level? Um, well, we're saying it's a string that's the UPC. Um, but then how do we know that worked? And so we're going to need to be able to observe something about the system to know that it did the right thing. Uh, typically, 
if we're executing a command, right, we're saying add product. And so that's a, a, a request for the system to change state, right, to start tracking that product. How do we know that it did it? Um, and so this is often where it's like, okay, well, maybe we can't start here. So we'll have to think about maybe there's a different place to start. Uh, Homeless 207. Um, oh my gosh. Kadmilia, Kad, Kadim, Kadimlias, sorry. I was actually, actually watching you before, uh, working on the Minecraft stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I know nothing about the Minecraft stuff. So welcome. Thanks for bringing your, your, uh, your huge party here. I appreciate it. What I'm working on is um, starting from scratch, doing test-driven development and hexagonal architecture on this supermarket checkout pricer exercise. Uh, so we're starting, we're starting from scratch. So it's a good time to join. Um, this is sort of a quick and dirty drawing of, uh, what we're doing, which is basically figuring out how would we implement a little supermarket checkout pricer? We scan products with a VPC, figure out how much they cost, do receipt printers, but we're doing it according to hexagonal architecture to separate, uh, concerns. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for joining. Uh, there's a question homeless 207 you had about uh, putting test files in the same folder. So in that sort of depends on the language and the test ecosystem that you're working with. In Java, 99% um, of the people are using JUnit. I know there's still some test ng people out there, but most people are using JUnit. Uh, and even with test ng, the structure is you have two separate um, folders. You have one for your code and one for all your tests. And that way, when you package things up, you only ship stuff in the code package, the tests don't, don't get shipped. Um, uh, yeah, I'm using Java 18 in case you were asking about what, what version, <laughs> like how you're executing a command against me, Java V. Uh, yeah, I'm using Java 18 because why not? I get to do whatever I want. Uh, with this project. So the first test that we want to write, if it's going to be add product and like, okay, what, how do we know that worked? So we have to have some way of querying the system, right? There's no system yet. There's no, no codes. So we don't quite know what to do, but we have to have some way of, of querying the system that the product got added. Now, if we were doing, um, a more London school style mock based approach, we might write a mock and then verify that a method was called and, and do something like that. Um, but I'm a classical TDD -er, so we're not going to do that. Yeah, Vivax. Yeah, every every uh, language does does things their own way. Um, so if we're gonna say, you know, so really it's, you know, right. That's a horrible test name. Um, but for now, when as we're think as a sort of thought process, that's you know that's okay. So we want to add a product. Um, we'll start with a toothbrush because I need a new toothbrush. Uh, and so basically it's, how do we know this worked? What can we observe about our checkout system that the product was added? Well, there's several things we could do. We could say, we could ask the, the cart, right? Which is the thing that's going to accumulate these products. Um, what you got? What's in you? What it, so treat it as a container that we can query. Um, we could also just say, I'm right now mainly interested in getting the price functionality working. I, I don't yet care about that it keeps track of products, right? All it knows is that you've added a product and it's accumulating the, the price. Um, so that's one possible uh, way to, to observe things. Uh, so we'll see that for, for testing, we, we're not going to actually use an H2 database. So um, I used to use H2 quite a bit, uh, but these days um, with test containers using Docker uh, and Postgres, um, we can do a lot of stuff in memory. So we'll we'll see some of that with, with some fake 
uh, repository implementations. Um, and then when we want to actually write to a real database, we'll use the real the real thing. That's what I do in my my other systems, uh, and it works really well. It's 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 a lot easier than it was just a couple of, of years ago. Uh, in memory is definitely faster, and we'll use that for our our unit tests. Yeah. So we're going to say that um, add product then part total price is $1. So we're going to say add toothbrush. All right, so that's what we're going to say. So we're going to say that the way we observe this, the way we observe the change to the system, right? Because we care about changes to the system. We add a product. It's worth, we're, we're saying that it's going to be a dollar so that when we ask the cart, it should be a dollar. Well, if we're going to do that, we end up with, with zombies again, um, with it, which is zero one many. This is the one case, but how do we know what a, a new cart is? I don't know. They charge for shopping bags. So maybe a new cart with a shopping bag is 25 cents. And so we need to establish a baseline of, of what it is when uh, the shopping cart is empty. So that means we, the way I do that is I basically put this test on hold and I start with an, a baseline test of, um, So the total price of the cart starts at starts at zero. Yeah, I don't want to mark it as disabled or ignored. Um, I want to basically for it that test to pretend like it doesn't exist. So that's why I deleted the the test annotation altogether. So now we have to figure out. Okay, great. So we're saying that our baseline assumption is that our our uh, cart system when it starts out has as when it basically starts out, assume it starts out as empty, it's uh, total price, total cost, maybe total cost is a better term. And starts at zero. So what do we instantiate? So now here's where we get to what is the object that we create? So remember that uh, we are in our core domain, in our core domain, we're at this application layer. So we're inside the hexagon, but we're not in our actual core domain. There's actually a piece piece that's outside of this. And let's see if I can change colors. Yeah, good enough. So basically over here, oh, that's a, that's a weird color. Um, this is the first thing that, that gets hit. Uh, and so that's our, our application layer or our use case layer, or sometimes called our application services layer. Uh, I've kind of been playing around with the terminology and I'm, and I'm even though application services layer is long, three words um i think it it gets the idea across that it's a service layer which means it has no state by itself yeah i guess that's the unicorn color <laughs> uh um i saw dude uh, am i making a time machine no i'm not making a time machine not sure what you mean by time machine um and so this is the first thing so we have to figure out um and so the way i start out is i pretend it has all that it needs uh everything that it needs so what is the method we're going to call to ask our system what is the total price well it'll be um we'll call it cart service i know not a great name but we'll we'll get we'll get to that later so we'll need to create one of these and so now we're actually creating our first class. Uh, so now we're going to split our screen because this is the way 
I really like doing development, having the test on the left and the code on the right. Um, and so, uh, so we've got our cart service. So given a cart service when it's new, um, when we query it and we say total cost. So here, side note, like this is where I'm always thinking about language, ubiquitous language from domain driven design. What, what do we call things? So products have prices. Um, they may also have cost, but I think I'm using price. What do we call the thing, like the, the, the amount of value that the, the card has? I'm using cost, but even that feels weird. Uh, so if you've got a better name than cost, what would you ask a cart? It's total, I guess the price. I don't know. It's weird. Uh, so we'll, we'll use total cost for now. Total amount, maybe total amount is better. And with this order total, let's use order total. And so since this is a query method, um, yeah, it could just be total since we're asking the cart service. Yeah, even better. All right, so we'll do that. Um, so then we'll just say total, we'll say cart total. So notice that as I'm refining the language, I'm also changing the, the method because you want the method to match the match its contents. Yeah. All right, so we'll go and create the method. Uh, it's not going to return void. We're going to start out with money being ints. We're not going to worry about money. Certainly not going to be using a float or a double here. Uh, we'll start out with ints, whole dollar amounts. Eventually, we will have to use something like a money class um, once we get into discounts and things like that. Yeah, it's very true. Good names tend to get shorter. Not always, but they, they tend to do that. Uh, so I'm going to return negative one. I'll sometimes return and throw an exception. Um, but here, because I, I know that sort of the expected value is zero, I can purposely return something that's basically not zero. Yes, I know I haven't used it yet, IntelliJ. Slow down. All right. So let's assign this to a variable total. Uh, and we're going to assert that total is zero. So our first test. Yeah, until you have three. Well, then you need packages and like yeah, three thousand classes. Hopefully, you don't have that many in one project. Um, so here's our first test. Uh, we now want to run it. We um, so my uh, I have a whole bunch of articles on my website about my predictive test driven. Uh, development process. So one of the things that I find really valuable is to predict how is this test going to fail? I know it's going to fail. And in this case, it's relatively easy because there's not much code. Um, but as the application gets more functionality, more code, it gets a little bit harder to, to predict. But um, being able to predict why it's going to fail or that it's going to pass is, is really valuable. So here, it's obvious it's going to fail because zero is not negative one. So let's run our tests. And in fact, it fails as expected. Great. We're going to return zero. That'll get our test to pass. Hey, Dudeman, welcome. Uh, hopefully, if you factor things well, Homeless 27, if the, as the app gets bigger, um, hopefully coupling levels out at a certain uh, a certain size, right? So if you've grouped things together, if you've architected it, uh, organize the code well, then you'll end up with clusters of objects that are coupled to each other, and then the connections between those clusters, which you might call modules or packages, uh, have, have very thin connections. All right, so that straightforward, right? Not a big deal. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do a commit. All right, so now we know we're going to add a product. Um, and we now have a way of, of observing what's the, the current 
uh, cart total. It might be tempting to take that zero, right, the zero here, and uh, make a field for it. But I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's where I want to go. At least I'm not I'm not sure. Maybe it'll be a field, or maybe I'll use um, sort of a sense of of just holding on to what products I have and dynamically calculate it on the fly. I don't know yet, so I can't sort of prematurely make a make a design decision. So I'm going to leave it at zero and, and let the tests tell me which way to go. So now we can turn this test on, right? I sort of always think about it as you know flipping flipping tests on and off. And so now we've got this test. So we want to add a add a product. Um, so we'll see that this is not an at service. Um, you, this is part of our application layer, which means it's uh, completely agnostic to frameworks. In fact, we haven't even added Spring yet. We're going to get there, but we haven't added it yet because we haven't needed it yet. So now we got to figure out, uh, we want to add a product. How do we know it was added? So we're saying that um, our total will be one. That's what we're, we're saying. We're saying a toothbrush is, is a dollar because it's a really cheap toothbrush. And um, that's how we'll know. So uh, let's create a cart service. That was weird. I don't know why I did that. So given a given a cart service when we add our product. So this is sort of our given when we add our product. And I'm not quite sure what this is going to look like yet. Um, we'll be able to assert that the cart when we ask the cart service for the total, it should be equal to one. Um, Unix 69, yes. Uh, eventually, uh, when I want to tie the inside of my hexagon, which is completely unaware of what framework I'm using, when I actually want to tie it to Spring, I will use an at bean in the configuration. Yep, exactly. Uh, oh, you're right, actually. So yeah, the, the 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 state won't even stay here. Eventually, it'll get refactored and pushed in uh, because services should not hold state. So again, this is this is um, my the way I develop software is I tend to refactor to create new classes rather than create them up front and start writing code in them. Um, I don't always avoid creating classes up front, but I tend to take classes from existing code. Uh, and so we'll probably pretty quickly do that. So add product. So what does this need to do? Um, we need to hand it some kind of product, but remember we're getting UPCs, uh, or if we want to be redundant, UPC codes. Um, so uh, we, we're going to basically make up the fact that there's some UPC code for our toothbrush. I, mean, I could probably go look, look look one up, but we don't need to be realistic right now. Not not just yet. Yeah, exactly, sweetie. Um, so what we're going to say is that uh, the contract for this service is that, well, UPCs are numbers, but they sometimes have leading zeros. Uh, in fact, I was I was playing around with um, seeing how good this third-party API service was with the UPCs. So I punched one in from this box of this bag of pistachios I've got here, uh, and it starts with a leading zero. So we can't use, even though UPCs are numbers, we don't treat them as numbers because we don't do math on them. Uh, and this is something I point out in, in my courses is like this. Yes, it's a value. Yes, it looks like a number, but we don't treat it 
as a long or float or anything like that. It's still a string. So we're going to want to pass them, this in then as a string. Um, so we're going to say that add product takes uh, takes a string and uh, that represents the the UPC. Now there's some stuff here around hexagonal architecture and value object and domain driven design around, well, we don't want to just pass strings in. How do we validate and things like that? But you know what? You, you can't do everything at once. So let's start here. Um, exactly homeless. That's, uh, that's the test driven development process. You, you write the test, watch it fail. Um, but before we can watch it fail, we got to get it to compile. So we'll need to implement this method. So since this method is a command, it doesn't return anything, uh, then we don't have to implement anything. So we're, we're good there. Uh, hey, Larry Kalarga, uh, are most Java jobs in finance banks? I don't think so. There are lots and lots of uh, Java applications um, for enterprises that aren't necessarily uh, finance and banks, um, but you will find a lot of Java in, in finance and banks. Yeah, a lot of insurance. Yeah. So I worked at a company called Guidewire Software, which provided insurance software for large insurance companies and was all in Java. Um, if you're interested in in uh, in TDD, yeah, like Space Camp Foundation, you said you can you can search for it. I've also got an article um, on it. Look it up here. And there's a whole series of articles on my website about uh, predictive test-driven development and how that works. All right, so we've got it to compile. Now we predict, well, uh, add product does nothing. Total always returns zero. So clearly this is going to fail because zero is not one. Great. Fails as, as expected. I wish, that depression, I wish Java was used everywhere. Um, I wish it was used more because I... We'll probably use it until my career is over. Um, but there's lots of lots of languages out there that lots of places that don't don't use Java. Um, so failed, fails as expected. So now we have to decide what do we want to do. Well, we can't obviously return a constant here anymore. So the next level up is um, some kind of if statement or a field, right? So we need to have some way of, of making a decision or storing information. So we could say, you know what, to get this test to pass, um, maybe we make it a field. Uh, eventually that might go away as we get additional requirements. But one of the things that I've learned is, um, and TDD I think really helps with, is what is the smallest step you can take that gets you to working code as you understand it right now. Uh, I'm not. Gonna, I don't see a need to use a static field. I'll just use a regular a regular field. But what I can do is I can treat this as a refactoring. So the way I do that is I basically um, turn off the failing tests because uh, Kentbeck has a has a great saying which is um, make the change easy and then make the easy change because the change we'd want is somewhere in here. Right, something like you know, uh, total plus equals one. Right, add on one to the total. We'd like that, except we don't have a variable. So I could write that code, create the variable, update the total method, and update the add product method, all while I have a failing test. My preference, though, is to do as much as possible while um, preserving existing behavior. Right, refactoring, uh, and so for that, I need to all test to to. Um, to pass. So I basically turned off the test that was failing and now I've got, well, one test. But now what I can do is I can take the zero and I can refactor it. So I can extract it using IntelliJ's uh, introduce field and say, this is now total. Where do I initialize it? I'll initialize it in the field declaration. That's fine. Now, again, this is a service. So this is sort of a way station, right? This is the cart service services don't have state. 
they have collaborators, right? They have references to other classes, but they should not have state. Um, there are times when they do, but like in general, they don't. Certainly they don't have domain state and total is domain state. But TDD and small steps tell us to start there and refactor our way once we see an opportunity to do that. Uh, Danny Depression, how a Java is taught is, is, is not off topic for me because as an educator, uh, right, as a software developer who's seen it, a lot of bad Java code, and then as an educator who tries to teach it right, it's very frustrating. All right, so that was just a refactor to introduce the field. Um, so nothing should have changed, right? So our test should still pass, and it does. So now we can do a commit um, refactored to introduce a total field. Now we can turn the test back on. It will should still fail for the same reason. And it does. Zero is not one. Um, and now we can basically write this code. Uh, JRE is totally free. The Java runtime is totally free. Unless you're like going to license it and incorporate it into a product, in which case it's still free. <laughs> All right. So that should get this test to pass. It is totally free for enterprise usage, unless you're using Oracle's, the one that you have to pay for, but there's lots of implementations that are free. Uh, space Camp Foundation, total is supposed to be cart quantity or price. Ah, good point. Uh, the intention is for it to be price. So if we think that total is confusing, um, I don't think it is because uh, I think I would use quantity if I want to know the quantity, but for now it's not obvious that it'll, that it, that it, that that is the price. Yeah, it it's a little confusing at this point, um, but we define that that total is is the total's price. Uh, but we could say cart uh, total price, and so here we said total price as well. So we're talking about the, the price. Uh, Jakarta is open source, so it's definitely free. Yeah, there's a common uh, misconception that because Oracle charge and still charges for certain Java JDK stuff, um, that it's not free, but it is totally free. All right, so we think this will make the test pass. Um, if, if I were to be really pedantic about TDD, I would do this, just total equals one. Um, then maybe let's do that. Why not? So this should get the test to pass though. And it does. Now, when I teach TDD, people look at me and like, Really? Look, we know we're going to be incrementing by stuff. Why don't you just do that? Um, and it's true. We could take a larger step, right? One thing that Kent Beck says is, is you know, we can use our professional judgment. Um, but I prefer to have uh, tests that, that force me to do things um, so that when I write code, I know that it's covered by a test. So it's sort of the inverse of, of, of sort of thinking about code coverage is I don't write code without a failing test, means that when that test passes, I know I've written uh, that scenario and I've got code that is truly covered by a test. So what would our next test be? Um, we could go with uh, adding a second item. So maybe we add two toothbrushes. Uh, hey, Larry, do I have any certifications? I, no, I don't believe in certifications. I do have a, a, a Java 1, or is it a Java 1.1? 1 .1. Uh, in the late 90s, I got a certification because one of uh, the companies I was doing training for required it. 
um, but I don't believe in certifications. I think um, I've I've helped people study for the Java certification, and this you know if you really like puzzlers, um, then that kind of thing is uh, interesting. Um, but honestly, eighty percent of the stuff that you need to know, it feels like um, there's such edge cases and corner cases that they ask in those certifications that I'm like, honestly, like I've I've looked at the certification. I tried. I basically took a, a sample certification. And I failed, and I've been doing Java for twenty six years. So. Uh, that's exactly right, Daddy Depression. Right, that it that allows and supports, and that's why when I when I um, have people learn that I say, even though you could do a bigger step, try smaller steps, because one of the things that's actually really hard sometimes is to to figure out what that smaller step is. All right, so we're gonna basically um, do something similar to to this test. I don't need this comment anymore. So we're going to add this product twice. And then our expectation is that when we ask the cart service for its total, uh, that's going to be equal to two. The thing I like about taking smaller steps, um, as I've really focused on that more, um, I end up with designs that, that were not always what I expected. Um, like in my head, I've got a design for where this cart service is going to go, but I don't know if I get there. All right, so if we do this, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the test will fail, right? Because it's going to return one, um, because every time we call add product, it's going to just assign one. We're expecting two, so it's going to fail for, for that reason. All right, so it fails for the right reason. We can throw in the plus equals, and now uh, and now it should pass. But there's a big assumption that the price of whatever product we add is is a dollar. Clearly, that's not true. Yeah, I actually um, looked at uh, the OCA exam book um, because there are some things where it's like, oh, maybe I should know that. But the way I look at it is like we use such a small part of the language that when we get the things that we don't often use, we just look them up. Like yesterday, I was exploring um, some different ways to use generics. Like I've used generics for, for a while, but I don't use them in every possible way. Uh, and I was like, is that going to work? And I basically had to try it and, and look it up. And it's like, oh, OK, that works. Um, and so especially with, with the tools we have, it's so easy to, to, to just try things. Um, I think it's more important to sort of have a good understanding of, of what's going on underneath rather than, than knowing sort of esoteric edge cases of things. All right, so our test pass. One of the nice things about them running fast is I can, if I forget if they passed, I can just do it again. So let's go ahead and do a commit. Um, And at this point, this is general enough. I don't. I know. I. I don't need to to do three. Um, and so one of the things that that TDD tells us to do, or guides us to do, uh, is think about the stories. You know, what functionality we want to implement, but also looking at the code to tell us what area do we need to explore next. Um, and so. Clearly, not all items are a dollar. And so some of the things that, that I look for are, are literals, right? Like this one. Where did that one come from? Oh, hey, JetBrains. Thank you. Yes, I, I love IntelliJ. Uh, so this, this one, where does it come from? Is a really interesting question, right? Clearly, it's related to this UPC, which is not being used. Uh, and so we should use it. And so what we want is a, is a test. Um, uh, for the it stuff, I know Kotlin uh, uh, uses that as well. So we want to expand on this, right? We want to sort of poke at this UPC thing. Like, how do we know what the price of a product is, right? We know cart service probably is going to add on and accumulate the, the pricing. But how do we 
How do we know what that, that UPC is worth? Well, we need then a test to drive us in that direction. So what we want is a test. That is something like add toothpaste because the toothbrush doesn't. Oh, jet brains. Oh, thank you so much for the, the 10 tier one subs. Wow. Thank you so much. We, we, we love you. Uh, so toothbrush isn't very useful without a toothpaste. So let's add some toothpaste. Um, then cart total price is, um, how much is toothpaste? Two bucks, $3. What was, I buy it in bulk. So it's like, how much did I pay for it? We'll call it $3. And uh, so the code's going to be the same. We, we probably want to get to something like, well, 0, 1, 2, 3 is sort of representing toothbrush. So we want something else that represents toothpaste as its, as its UPC. So one thing I want to do now to make the tests easier to read, right? Because one of the things we want to focus on when we're doing coding and especially test-driven development uh, is making the test readable. So let's extract this to a constant. And we're going to call this, um, what do we say? This is the toothbrush UPC. Uh, not UPS. That's the name of a shipping company, UPC. There we go. Uh, so now this makes the test easier to read. Right? It's still a constant string, but, it, but it's easier to read. And so now we can, um, I'm going to grab this test and let me take out the comments. They're not needed. And so here we're going to want, um, something like that is represents the UPC. All right. The code for our toothpaste. And so this, at this point, I want to make it clear that this is associated with toothpaste. So I'll, I'll immediately uh, extract it to toothpaste, UPC. Now our expectation though, we said it was $3. By the way, um, copying and pasting tests, I don't mind that. Copying and pasting code, maybe I'd think a little bit more about, but copying and pasting tests, um, I don't mind doing that. One thing you have to be careful of, though, of course, is when you copy paste, uh, you forget to change things. Uh, I have a license for IntelliJ. I actually don't use all the other products. IntelliJ is all I need, so I've got a license for that, but I've used it for 20 years, so I feel like it's all I need. Um, because really, what else do you need? You're programming in Java, and it has everything you need. So I'm going to pretend that I didn't see the one and pretend that I thought it was a three. So at this point, I, ex I expect my test to fail because it's only, only adding one. And so uh, I'm going to expect the test to fail because one is not three, because I'm thinking it's expecting three. But it passed. That concerns me. I'm like, that shouldn't have passed. And so this is why I like predicting failure specifically, um, because you make mistakes in, in credit when writing tests. Uh, yes, once copying and once the test setup code gets to a certain size, then you want to really start to refactor the test setup code um, for test data builders and things like that. Oh, JetBrains, that would be wonderful. I will definitely raffle it off because I have what I need, but uh, more than happy to reward my my uh, viewers. All right, so this should now fail because I've corrected it uh, because three is not one, and perfect. So now, now what do I do? All right, so this one is no longer sufficient as a constant, uh, as as a well constant literal. Uh, I could change it to three. That's going to make things worse. Right, it'll make the current test pass, but it'll make other ones fail. So now, clearly, a constant isn't going to work here. So what do we do? Well, we know that, that the amount, the price of it, 
Uh, certainly. Let me, let me whisper. All right. Um, yeah, so once I get that from JetBrains, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll run a giveaway on, on a future stream. So what we want to do is we want to associate this UPC with this number. So we could do an if statement, right? As, as the start of, of down that, that, you know, ratcheting up the complexity, we could do an if statement. And so what's interesting is uh, this const these constants, um, I could convert it to an enum, but that, that doesn't feel right, right? Uh, but that would be really easy to do. Uh, but, it, but we could start out with just a simple if statement. Maybe we only have two products. Maybe we're a toothbrush, toothpaste vending machine, and all we care about is the price of two products. And then an if statement might be fine. And so this is, again, this idea of keep things only as complex as they need to be, right? Immediately, you could, go, you could go to some kind of map, or you can now extract a service that does this, right, a product catalog that associates things. But we'll start out simple. So let's do, um, we could write some code. So let's make sure that we're, we know where we are in terms of our tests. So we changed this back to one, so we still have one failing test. But changing this one to basically an if statement, um, that might uh, that might be something we could do as a refactoring. So let's get all our tests passing. And oops, I commented out the wrong one. I meant to comment out this one. So I'm going to basically make the, the, the change easy, and I'm going to do it in a, in a place where all my tests are passing. So replacing this one with an if statement is equivalent. Um, so I'm going to extract this also to a constant, and this is toothbrush price. Price or cost? We'll use price. So that should be equivalent. I mean, I hardly even need to, to code that. And so now I can wrap this in an if statement. If UPC and what we say it was uh, toothbrush, that's this one. then that should be equivalent. Uh, Unix is going to create a cart object at some point. Um, at some point, yeah, I need a domain object. Right now I've got a service that I'm sort of, it's dual purpose. Um, but uh, right now I don't, nothing's pushing me there just yet. We're, we're getting there, but not yet. So this should be equivalent code, right? It's a little bit more complex. Um, it's a little bit more precise, so that you could say the behavior is slightly changing, but it's close enough. Um, and the main point, though, is it should still pass all the tests. So it does. And so now if I add, sort of turn this test back on, um, it will now fail for a different reason than it failed before. So that shows that behavior has actually changed. So before it failed because when I added one item, it was counted as a dollar. Now I'm adding an item and it's counted not at all. But that's okay, I can predict that. And I can say that that's, that's okay. All right, so now I get three and not zero. So now what I can do, I could say plus equals three. All right, I could do that. That would make it work. Or I could say, you know what, look, we're probably going to have several different products. Let's make sure it's one of those. Um, and so we'll just say else if UPC 
equals. And I don't know why I keep typing UPS. I guess I think about that more. Expecting, waiting on an expected package. So now I think this will pass. And it does. I've got this three. And I could say, you know what, for symmetry purposes, let's extract this to a constant. So this is a uh, toothpaste price. And now I've got other literals. So this is tooth, not to toothbrush UPC. I've seen that before. I could have copied it over from the test. Um, but I'll just continue to extract constant on this. Uh, and this is an object. Yes, thank you, IntelliJ. Um, this is toothpaste UPC. That was just some basic refactorings. Everything should still work. But now at least we've assigned some, some names to things. The other thing that things that it does is it makes this easier to see that we have a pattern. Right, we've got if it equals something, then we have when they were adding a price. So let's do a commit, and then we're going to do some refactoring. Uh, so add product now uh, knows price of tooth brush versus tooth paste. Thanks, JetBrains. I appreciate you stopping by, and, and thank you so much for the gift. Really appreciate it. Say, say hi to everybody at JetBrains. All right, so let's commit that. Now, from a refactoring standpoint, what do we want to do? Well, one thing we could do is we could look for duplication. So um, the duplication that I see I actually see two different types of duplication. I see this duplication, right? The comparison for the UPC against some string. Uh, and I see a duplication around updating the price. So both are duplicates, and I've wanted, I'd like to eliminate those as duplicates. So What I want to do is is have a method that, given a UPC, um, will give me the current price for that item. So let's see what this does. Perfect. So what I've done is I've pulled out um, Right, because because I'm I'm basically thinking this section of code is going to be replaced by a method, by basically some kind of lookup method. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to isolate that. I could have let it have direct access to total, but that's not its job. So that's why I extracted out this variable. Um, now, I want to see if I, I don't usually do this. Let's see if I do it the other way. So I want to replace all occurrences, but what if I don't replace the right axis occurrences? Yeah, so these are all right accesses, um, and I want to and I want to separate that. So um, yeah, so the, the the extraction I did would have would have made the test fail. Uh, what I really want and maybe I'll just extract the method and, and let and uh... so if we extract the method, it's going to directly access the field. And I don't want that. So what could we do? We could um...
So item price is total, but this this fails the test. There may not be a direct way to refactor to what I want. So I expect this to, to, to fail. And it does. So that's good. Um, so what I can do is I can say total plus equals item price. Uh, and then start this out at zero. So there's a bit of manual work. So that works, um, but I kind of do want to find like a way to, could I extract total plus? Uh, yeah, let's try that. So, yeah, so the problem is this is, this is a field and any ex any method extract I I do um, is not going to work. I could extract it to a method and push it as a parameter, but it really needs to be a return, not a parameter, because I don't want a, an accumulating parameter. Um, if I replace it with that. Yeah, I may have to, let's see, uh, I extract this. to a method. The problem is anything, I, I, yeah, I need to basically move this up in scope. And, um, is there a refactoring that'll do that? Yeah, I don't, maybe there is, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Usually I'm pretty good at seeing it, but I'm, I'm not seeing it. So let's go with the thing we had before with the manual work. Uh, so let's, um, we've got our tests. Let's make sure we're, we're at passing tests before we do this. Okay. So we're, we're good. Um, I'm just going to do this manually. So basically, uh, item price equals create scope for that. Oops, did that too early. Item price equals total plus equals item price, which I will have to bring into scope. Uh, there is no way to turn this into a ternary because there are um separate specific equals if this was just an else then i could turn it into a ternary uh but because there's two separate uh explicit if equals uh, i can't do that all right so let's run our tests okay yeah so our goal is we want a method so now what we can do is we now that we have sort of the item price separated from totaling up that item price now we can extract this to um item price for. Uh, why are you passing an item price, though? I don't think I need you. Yeah, it shouldn't have needed to do that. That was weird. Um, we should just be able to return this into uh, a direct return, but we'll, we'll do that as a refactoring. So what we can do now is we can um, actually just inline this. And so we get total is total plus equals price for UPC. Oh, I didn't select the declaration of the item price. That's why. Okay. Oh, that's why it was passing it in. Got it. So let's do that again. So what we want is this. 
price for yeah so the extra parameter should have been a signal to me there we go much better thank you uh and now we can inline this and so now we have this method and so this method is doing the the translation between that uh upc string um and and the price and so my goal is to push this somewhere else. It does not belong in cart service, right? It's It should be some other responsibility. Where it goes, I don't know yet. So I don't have a good sense of, of well, I have a little bit of a sense, uh, probably some product lookup. But right now I don't I don't have a reason to, to push it there. So all of our tests should, should pass. And there we go. So let's do a commit. Um, method uh, what's up price for you can see all right so that works um so what's our next step Um, we've got our price that handles multiple items. We could mix it up, try a mixture of toothbrush and, and toothpaste. Uh, lookup. Is lookup one of the classes of port missing? Um, if it's a lookup, uh, if it's sort of a one-to-one, -one, then it might be, yeah. Um, I'd almost call it a I might be tempted to call it a catalog rather than, than a lookup. Lookup doesn't sound verby. Whereas I kind of want my my ports to be verbish, verby. Uh, but um, so kind of like UPC finder or product finder. Uh, lookup might be the method name, but it doesn't feel like it should be the class name. All right, so. Um, this sort of pushed a little bit on the product identifier. But in our application, where are we getting that product information from? Is that part of our system or is that part of an external system? Um, and do we want to push on, on that aspect yet? I think... I'd want something that that starts pushing on uh, sort of separating the application class here from from the domain. And there are a couple of different ways I could do that. One is uh, to have um, basically extract total because now uh, total is is suffering from primitive obsession. So primitive obsession. Uh, is a is a code smell where we have some primitive variable like like int um, and there's behavior associated with it. So we could solve primitive obsession by extracting cart. That's one way to go. Uh, or we could extract the price finder uh, to another um, service. Or we could do both. Let's do both. So which one to do first? Um, let's let's uh, extract the price for. Let's do that. So what do we want to move it to? Um, it's going to be. Uh, product finder. We haven't really defined product. Do we want to define product? Because I'm not quite sure what the interface is. I guess the interface is that it accepts a, a UPC string and then returns uh, returns the price. Um, kind of feel like this int is going to cause us problems pretty soon. So maybe we want to take care of that first. Uh, or we could just treat this because I, I don't know if I want to pull in the money class just yet. 
uh, we could treat it as... Well, we'll leave that for now. I, but I think this is it's going to be coming uh, pretty close that we'll need... Um, we'll need some something else for that. All right, so... Let's pull out um, this method. So what we want is, um, we're going to call this uh, product finder, product pricer, because that's really all we care about right now. Given a UPC, what's its price? Uh, what do we need from that? Just this method plus um, this information needs to go with it. And let's refactor that. I don't understand why when I when I when it extracts it to a delegate, IntelliJ seems to leave the method behind. Um, like, I would like you to just inline it. Actually, I would like you to get rid of it because. Inlined it here, but now this method actually is no longer needed, so we can just delete it. All right, so we extracted product price here. Let me actually open this up, take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to actually drag it down here. Um, this is a pure refactoring, a little riskier than just an extract method. Uh, so we want to make sure our tests pass, and they do. So let's do a commit, um, extracted product to price uh, finder into separate class. And uh, we could go down the road of making product pricer into a proper port. Because one of the things we said in, in our design um, was at least that getting some of the information about that uh, product by its UPC was an external service. I hadn't originally been thinking, though, that it would um, provide us with a price. I was actually kind of thinking there'd be a catalog uh, that would be in the database. Um, but just because it's stored in a database doesn't mean our port, so this is a port, uh, or, or would become a port, uh, doesn't mean it, have to, it has to look like a repository. The implementation of looking up price, that's an implementation detail. All right, so we've got add product, and basically it totals up the product. So I think we've, we've pushed out on the product pricing stuff. What we... I think what I'd like to do next is sort of push on, okay, I'm done. Uh, show me, you know, give me my receipt. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to not just track the cost of the items that were added, I want to track the actual items that were added. Uh, so I could push on that for the receipt, or maybe what's more interesting is push on the discounts. Because that, that's actually the main one of the main things behind this uh, supermarket checkout price or exercise is all these special deals and discounts. So maybe let's push on that because that will um, likely lead us to a cart that stores the actual products that were added, and not just bumping up the price. So let's do a simple one. Yes, happy July 4th is from, thank you. Uh, this one, let's do this one. So this one will also make us uh, have to go away from int towards something else. Um, could do big decimal, but eventually it'll be, uh, it'll be a money of some sort. But we could, we could do big decimal in the meantime. Um, so let's do this story. So buy two, two, buy two of the same item. And you get one for half off. What a deal. Uh, yes, I could store it as sense. I was thinking about doing that, but you know, I may as well just bite the bullet and go to, go to big decimal or something. All right. So this is, this is, um, what we want. 
so I'm going to actually create another test class because this is here. This was sort of about your general straightforward ad product. Now we're getting on to special deals. So let's create a new um, a new test class. Oh, right. I don't have a. We'll just do it this way. So this is uh, special deals uh, test. Card test. So let me import that. So add two toothbrushes. Uh, which means we're actually we actually might need to not write a new one. Uh, so I'm gonna go back here. Here we added two toothbrushes. Um, let's change this test. Actually, let's copy this test. And then I'm gonna change it. Add uh, so two items. Then cart total price is. Uh, sum of product prices. So instead of the toothbrush, we're going to actually add toothpaste. Uh, and then this should be three plus one is four. Uh, so this technique is um, what Kent Beck calls evident data. Right? I'm showing that what we want is the sum of item, uh, the two individual item prices. So we're just changing the test. This should still pass. I could force it to fail by just changing this, but we know how that works. All right. So now in here, we can copy this. And so uh, this this thing, these toothbrush UPCs, um, we can let's share them. So adding two toothbrushes, what we're saying, well, we can't say one point, well, we could say 1.5. Clearly it won't be the same. Um, so let's start here and then we'll refactor uh, moving to big decimal. Although we may as well just move to um, Let's see, what value object would we want? This is uh, order total. Um, I don't know if I want to go to a value object just yet. But I think we'll go to big decimal. So this should pass. Um, so let's refactor, and then we'll basically change this test to be the discount. So we want to change. Uh, can we do a type migration? I don't think so. Yeah, because it's not really a type. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and just change this to big decimal. This we can actually start with zero. Uh, this we can change it to that. Yeah, I'm going to change the test method to basically say uh, one item is half off, but it's not. That's not what it's doing yet. Uh, this one, let's. Um, Right now, the price we can leave is whole dollars. Uh, so what we're going to do is change this to be uh, total equals total. Why am I having trouble spelling total? Total add. Uh, and then we'll grab this. And that will value of. I guess we could just convert product pricer as well. Yeah, let's do that. Let's just do it.
I like how it's like, sure, I'll go change that, but I'll make it not compile anymore. Um, how far do we want to go? Uh, let's just do that. Okay. Hey there, uh, Buffy Land. Yes, I am doing TDD. Uh, so you meant the fact that toothbrush is a dollar or is hidden from the test. Um, open to suggestions on solving that. So this should be equivalent. Um, this equal to uh, what we'd like to do. Um, is uh, equal I think we want is yeah is equal to two. That's what I want. Yeah, if you got suggestions, so we just throw them in chat. Um, okay. So this was a refactor to introduce and change our type from int to, to big decimal. I think we've got it everywhere. Uh, probably a bunch of our tests are gonna complain. Let's see. Yeah, incompatible type. Um, so let's just change that. <laughs> and yes, they change. They they uh, are broken because um, we're testing uh, ints versus versus big decimal. So let's go fix that. Um, turns out we can fix this by uh, doing this. Um, so we'll wrap this with a string. Uh, this one though, will actually just convert to a big decimal. Let's see how that works. All right. Yeah, eventually I'm yeah, I am gonna move price the the product pricer into a port and stub it out so we can be clear. Um but you're right that right now this uh the information is, is hard coded here. We could actually um how do we feel about referencing this directly since it's a static, referencing it directly in our test? Yeah, there's something that creates the product pricer, right? There's something that that puts stuff into there, and right now that 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 is a bit hidden. I think I, I think I'm gonna delay that until we we extract that to a port and then stub it out, um, and we'll get something like data depression, what you're talking about. All right, um, did our test pass? Yes, they did. Okay. So you may be wondering, how does this work? Right, I'm basically saying total, which returns a big decimal, is equal to a string. So it turns out the implementation of this um, basically takes care of converting the given string to a big decimal for you. So what's nice about that is you can say 8.0 and you don't have to uh, convert it to a big decimal yourself. It will do that for you. And how did I know that was there? Uh, cause I wrote, I wrote it. <laughs> this was my, my big contribution back in the day to what was then called fest was all the big decimal assertions. All right. Um, are we converted to big decimal? I think we are converted to big decimal. Uh, that's here and in our product pricer. Uh, so we're, so we're all good. Hey, it's Diamante. All right. Awesome. So cart service now is, is much, um, is much smaller. One of the things you'll notice is this hidden dependency, right? So this is a collaborator. The product pricer is a collaborator, but it's a hidden collaborator because it's not injected into cart service. And that's causing some of these problems that, that daddy depression. So here have mentioned of like, 
this product pricer is a bit opaque. Um, so we'll want to make it more, more transparent. Uh, and do we want to make it a stub or a fake is the question. Not sure. Might want to, might want to start with the stub, but let's do a commit, uh, converted to big decimal for total, uh, part price. All right. So we did that. Before we extract out and fix the product pricer, let's do the special deals. So we were saying that it should not be two, but it should be 1.5. And how do we know that? Because we just know. Um, so two toothbrushes, uh, are um then second is discounted uh 50% or just half off all right so this will now so now we're back I haven't been wearing my TDD hat um, because it's actually a bit warm today, uh, but I've got my my TDD change behavior, and that's where we are. We're in change behavior. Um, we are now out of the the refactor. So putting my change behavior hat on, um, this test will now fail. It'll fail because right now we're not doing any discounting. Um, So we're going to get two instead of 1.5 and that's what we get. So what's the smallest step we can take to do this? Um, all we're doing is, is totaling up, uh, the price as the items are added. We don't keep track of the actual products. So there's no memory. And so there's no way to, to, to know have two products, um, have two of the same product been added. Now here's where it's like, well, how do we know what, what products are the same? Well, we've got a UPC so we can look at that. So unless there's a smaller step for this particular special deal, um, I think we're going to have to uh, hold on to the products as they're added. But if you've got a smaller step, let me know. Um, but if that's the if that's going to be our small step, then we can. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah, so I could do it based off of of the price. Um, if the current total is one, uh, but I think we'd pretty quickly get to a test that that doesn't work. Um, and I don't feel like it's, it gets us closer to what we really, I think eventually want is keeping track of the history of items of products, excuse me, of products that are, that are added. So it's a smaller step, but I'm not sure it's, a, it's, it's a smaller step that takes us in, in the right direction, but it did, it did definitely come to mind. Um, Yeah, I don't know that it, that allows me to refactor to where I want to where I want to go. So, what I can do is I can say um, disable the test and do basically a prepare refactoring. Uh, that's a good idea, Daddy Depression. I could basically just say, right now, I want to know what products are in the cart. That'll also force me into the same situation, uh, and it would put aside looking for, did, did you already add this item? So that's, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, so we can turn this off, um, 
And what's interesting is if we had gone down the direction of getting the receipt, then we would have gotten the same the same thing, right? Basically, we need to know what the, what are the contents of the cart. Uh, so that means so the question is if we go the receipt route to force this, um, that means we have to have a way to get access to the contents of the cart and expose it through the the cart services API. Uh, is there any other? No matter what, if we if we're going to make it observable and know what, um, yeah, we're going to have to do that anyway. So let's do that. So let's create another another test, um, and this is our uh, cart receipt. Our, our our naming here is a little bit feels a little bit off because we're talking about cart, but then we're talking about cart receipt, and it's like, do you get a receipt for a cart? Cart sort of at this temp. I mean, it's funny how you know we use words from the physical world and we and we put those in in our e-commerce systems, and then it feels weird. Like we talk about you know adding stuff to a cart and the cart having a price, though it's not until we actually turn it into an order or we take it out of our cart and it gets put into bags and we actually pay for it. So there's some language weirdness here, but let's let's not go there. Um, so cart receipt test is what we'll do next. And so what we'll do is we'll do, um, well, now we can, now we can, yeah, I guess we could call it cart content test um, and sidestep the fact that this might be used for receipt generation. Uh, sure, I'll buy that. So we're basically going to say uh, empty uh, new cart has no contents. Uh, cart. All right. Um, so now, <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Um, where we've been talking about carts, but we actually don't have cart as a class. We have cart service, which has been serving as this hybrid entity service thing. Uh, we want. A new cart. How do we create a new cart? We can't just new up a cart. We could new up the cart service, but is that really a new cart? So we might need some things to to force us to 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 separate these. We could just separate them due to hexagonal architecture. We could say, look, cart service is wrong. It should not have any state, and we could justify it that way, or we could really um, force TDD to 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 force us there. Um, I think since, since I'm sort of like using this more for, from a hexagonal architecture point of view, let's go that way. Except we're 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 still going through the API, so um, yeah, it's it's either way we'll get there. Um, but I feel like actually, even though we could divide it by because of hexagonal architecture rules, I think driving it through the the test would might be more interesting. So there was an implication that um, when we create a cart service that it implicitly created a new cart. So what can we do to force something different? Um, and thinking outside in, uh, this and this is where it gets into sort of, we want to purchase, we want to place the order, right? We want to basically conclude the transaction so we could go to sort of looking at the cart contents. Um, 
But if we want to sort of, you know, take a step back and think outside in, what do, what do we want here? What we want is sort of, we've, we, we got onto special deals, but we actually didn't finish sort of a full, what is the minimal sort of, you know, cart system that we can, that we can create that doesn't do special deals, um, but we can actually finish and place an order. So maybe we need a place order. All right, so we've added, right? We've we've started the system, we've added products, and it gives us a running total if we want. Um, but at some point we'd like to actually place that order, right? Complete the transaction. And so maybe it, it makes sense to to do that before we get onto the to the special deals. Um, and this is where I think uh you know, this this gets back to sort of further out from uh, outside in development, which is, how, you know, in what order do you create your features and your stories? And so what you want is something that you could deliver, right? It might be the most useless cart system, but hey, if you've got, you know, a website, for example, that only sells toothbrushes and, and toothpaste, doesn't have special deals, then you want to be able to conclude the order and, and, and pay for it. We're not going to deal with payment because uh, I think we've already got enough complexity. But I think the idea of saying, OK, I basically now want to buy this. I think that actually needs to be our next step um, before, you know, and it may cause some of these other things to happen. But I think we need to do that uh, before because uh, that'll that'll flesh out some of these other issues. So if we think about, um, so we've got add product to cart test. Uh, our special deal stuff is on hold, so I'll close that window. Um, and so we've got uh, cart contents, but I think we can basically say um, place order. Now we need to figure out, like, what are we implementing here? I said supermarket checkout pricer, but maybe it's an, it's an online supermarket. They have those. So Regardless, there would either be, if it were like a kiosk, there would be a button to say, okay, I'm done, um, pay now, or online there would be, you know, basically place order. So let's rename this actually to be um, place order. All right, so you have a good, have a good evening, night. Yes, it is late for you. So then... What's the quickest way to get to um, sort of resetting the cart? All right, because that's really what place order does. Basically, place order says, all right, you're done. Here's how much to pay. Uh, and then we start over. All right. <clears throat> so our goal is um, carts are, are, are transient. They, they hang around for a while, but then they're when we place the order, then they're done and they're thrown away and a new one is created. So um, if our scenario is uh, place an order, try to place an order with an empty cart, that's not valid. But we can start there. Um, or we can start with a valid case, which is add an item, place an order, not only uh, should the order total be whatever the, the, the cart total was, um, but the cart should now be empty. So let's do um, add uh, one product place order then uh, empties cart let's do that so we'll create our cart service and we'll do something like cart service um call it finalize order, 
put call it place order. Could just call it order. But we'll we'll do finalize order. Create that method. I don't know what it's gonna do yet. Um, so now what are we gonna assert? Well, if this test is all about that it empties the cart. Uh, oh, we had to add a product. So let's go add a product. So um, so it's really cart with product place order. Um, when we place the order, then it empties the cart. So we'll add a product. And uh, we'll add our toothbrush. And so when we finalize our order, um, our expectation now is that, whoa, oh, I didn't import my assertions. Let's do that. So now our expectation is that cart service um, total, although it'd be nicer to say it's empty. Um, that's what I'd like. I'd like is empty to be true. Except we can't do that because is empty doesn't exist. So we know, don't know that that works as a reliable way to observe the state of the cart. So what do we do? Uh, we basically put this test on hold and we go back to our add product and we go back to our baseline cart total price starts at zero. Um, I am fine with saying not only is the price zero, but it's contents, but it's basically, it's empty. Uh, so let's inline that. So now I'll create the method. That's a Boolean. Uh, here, I don't want to return false. I actually want to throw um, an unsupported operation exception uh, to really make it clear that I haven't implemented this yet. And so this should be um, true. So we can run this. It's going to fail because it's going to throw an exception. And now we can basically return true. Whoops. Now it should pass. Um, now we need a, a test that basically forces it to be not true. Uh, so we're not only going to check that the total price is there, but we're also going to say um, assert that the cart service uh, is empty. That's false. And it's really interesting um, how often objects are containers that hold things. Here, the cart, the cart service, but really the, the cart holds products. Although right now it's not holding any products, it's just holding the prices for those. But it, it's, it acts like this container. And so we can often ask a lot of our objects, are you empty? You know, whether it's a cart that's holding orders um, or whether it's a bank account that holds transactions. We can kind of ask if it's empty. It may make less sense about an account is empty, although if it is empty, that means there are no transactions and that tells us that there's nothing in there. But is empty is not the same as uh, has a zero amount or a zero balance. But it's really interesting how, how a lot of these things are similar. Uh, in fact, there is a whole set of object-oriented patterns, um, container, uh, is one of one of those patterns. All right, so this will fail because right now we're, we're hard coding returning uh, true. So that failed as expected. Um, so let's, uh, so another way, instead of, I could undo that change and get and refactor it, but I know I've got one test failing and I know it's failing right here. Um, so I can sort of keep track of that without having to, to go back in, into the green state. It's a known red. 
Um, so I'm fine with actually doing a refactoring here. Here, I'm just going to extract this to a field. And this is basically... Um, it's empty. And we'll, we'll declare it in... Uh, sure, the field declaration is fine. So this was a refactoring, so it should still fail. Um, now we can do is add product. We can basically say is empty. It's false. We don't have a remove product, so that's fine. And that should now pass. So now that we have some way to detect whether a card is empty or not, let's go ahead and, and commit that. Um, we're not ready to commit that or that. So now our expectation here <clears throat> um, is that finalizing order uh, basically sort of resets the cart. So not only uh, should the cart be empty, but actually the total should be zero as well. So in a sense, it should return to its original state. So this will fail because finalize order doesn't do that. All right, and it, it got tripped up first on this. So when you have two assertions, and again, I'm not, some people are like, well, you could only have one assertion. I'm like, well, what is it? What can we say and observe about a cart, you know, that's been finalized and basically it's gone and now there's a new one, sort of an implicit new one, is these two properties. One isn't enough to say that it's empty. Um, maybe you've got a free item in there, or if it's empty, maybe the total wasn't reset. Uh, so we'll um, first fix this one. So we're going to keep this, we're going to, um, we could have split this into two separate tests, and then we have a failing test and a passing test and a failing test and a passing test. I I actually don't mind, as long as you predict how the test fails, in a sense, that's a, a uh, expected behavior, which is what we're looking for out of our test. So the first thing we want to handle is the totals reset. So let's do that. So now the test will fail, but now it'll fail because it's not empty. Uh, and so now we can basically is empty it is true again, and that should get our test to pass. Uh, so Space Camp Foundation asks about shopping carts. It's, you know, um, one of the hardest things as an instructor uh, is coming up with examples that are at least somewhat realistic. Um, and this is the problem I have with uh, tutorials that do things like with animals and dogs and cats barking and meowing, because that's not realistic unless you're actually simulating a world where that happens. Uh, so you want something that's somewhat realistic. Um, but you also want something that's non-trivial. Uh, and one of the things that most people seem to know how to do is go shopping. Um, the examples I typically use are either like a shopping cart uh, or some kind of purchase kind of thing um, or around a game. But I think more people know about shopping than they know about blackjack. Blackjack is the game I use in my is in my course, uh, which, by the way, I should mention. Uh, so I'm releasing a course on hexagonal architecture where this example, um, or I'm, I'm not releasing it, I'm launching it. Uh, it'll be released um, over the next uh, few months, uh, but um, launching it uh, later this month. Um, so I use blackjack as one of my primary examples, but I wanted a secondary example that had a bit more, uh, a bit different kind of thing. And so shopping carts, we we know what they are, we know how they work, we know how to pay for stuff. 
Um, we also often know about discounts and things like that. So uh, that's why it's used a lot as an example. Yeah, well, yeah, I also see like blog post stuff, but I don't I don't find that compelling because one of the things that I want from my examples is non-trivial domain behavior. Um, because um, we don't, you know, I could create a to-do list, but there's no behavior there. Um, to-do list is also popular. Uh, I could, you know, there's a bunch of kinds of things where there's sort of very much a data focused. And one of the things I try to do is really focus on behavior because it it's harder and it and uh it doesn't get enough attention um and it allows me to then uh talk about domain driven design and hexagonal architecture and things like that all right so um this is now working let's go ahead and commit uh So when we finalize an order, that basically um, clears out the cart. Um, so why did we do this? We did this because we wanted to try and get to the point where uh, we can refactor our way to, to a cart. So this cart service might not look like much, right? It's what, 30 lines of code maybe, not even. Um, but it's it's got some some design issues. Uh, if nothing else, um, it it violates what a service has. But we've already got sort of multiple states here that are very much connected. Right? You change one, you change the the other. Um, right? We change total and is empty together. So these are paired. And so uh, the data depression's idea of returning a pair, it's actually a code smell that tells us there's there's something deeper here. Um, one thing I do is, is uh, <clears throat> I use a wallet class to hold money as one of my TDD examples. Um, and there you can sort of have this idea that, you know, your wallet is empty if there's no money in it, basically if, it, if it's zero. Here we can't quite say the same thing because we might have a, a free product. We don't know. Uh, but because these two variables, the, the total and the is empty, are very much two aspects of, of, of a single thing, right? There's there's sort of this cart object that's asking to be created, if nothing else, due, due to this code smell, something that encapsulates total and, and is empty. But maybe it's not. we're not quite there yet. So now we can go to sort of add um, add product to uh, no the uh, what we wanted was special deals. So can we implement this yet? Right. So this is um, a, you know we already have uh, finalize order. Um, so we kind of have, could we ship what we have now? Um, actually let's take, let's think about that, right? If our, you know, simplest feature is we can walk up to the system, add a toothbrush, finalize the order. Um, what are we missing? What we're missing is sort of how much was this? And so maybe, uh, Maybe this is what pushes us to, well, we need an invoice or receipt or something that tells us this is the order you placed. Um, and again, I'm assuming finalized order behind, you know, we're, we're sort of assuming payment is made behind the scenes. So then that means finalized order. Uh, does it return something? So uh, I have a rule that inside of my domain objects, right, those in my domain layer, uh, they have two kinds of methods, queries 
where you can ask it for information and commands where it does something but does not return information. Finalize order, does that return something? And here's where it's like, it could return something. Um, that, you know, that sort of, uh, my head's tingling because it's like, uh, I don't like that. Um, because I like commands and queries. Uh, but for now, it may be okay. The other thing is, is okay, this is sort of a single purpose machine, right? Single user machine. So we don't have to worry about order identifiers or things like that. So maybe that's okay. And maybe uh, that means somewhere later, we'll have something that we want to have simultaneous multi-user carts um, or some need for that. Uh, then, then we can wor worry about it then. So what do we want from a finalized order? And sort of in a sense, we want um, two things. We want the total plus we want its contents. So let's So let's uh, rename place order to finalize order. And so we can pretty much take this, this uh, setup and say what we want is we want to be able to assert. Uh, and so now we have to decide what are we returning here? Um, we could return the final price or we could uh, jump to returning a receipt. So a final price doesn't tell us anything different. Um, really, again, what we're trying to get at is, is uh, m right. And, and this is where it gets difficult. Is we're, we're balancing two things. We're trying to implement functionality that's useful that we can get feedback on. Um, but we're also trying to stretch out the flexibility of our production code. And one of the things we want from our production code is we know we need it to remember the products that have been added. So one way is we can um, just ask the cart, what are your contents and do it that way. The other is be able to finalize the order and get a receipt and inspect, um, inspect it that way. So let's do that. So we're going to say receipt equals one of those. We don't know what that is. We'll create, um, we'll just create the class, uh, except we want it in our code. Flip that over. Actually, we'll maybe flip it down here. Uh, hey there, trash of Twitch. Um, I disagree with your premise. Uh, things that you don't know are hard. That's true for anything. Um... And for web development is is too ambiguous to to make any kind of statement about. But I'm not, I'm not I don't get into language comparisons or ecosystem comparisons because I find those to be pointless. Uh, you use what what you think is best for reasons, um, and I, I don't I don't get into sort of debates and discussions about differences between ecosystems because that's like you know pointless. Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into that that discussion because I'm a Java developer and it's trivial for me to create a, a quick REST API server, but it depends on what you want to do with it and what you have to connect with. Um, there's a lot more complexities than just creating an API server from scratch. 
All right, so let's make finalize order return a receipt. Um, and we're going to have it return null. That's totally fine. Um, in a sense, that's a refactoring. So um, other than this test that we're working on, no test should fail if it were a true refactoring. So they don't. So the first thing we can assert is simply that it's not null. And I see these sort of like little steps, like, okay, I want it to return something that's not null. Um, I could even say that it's exactly an instance of a receipt. Which is kind of pointless because by definition, it has to be a receipt. So um, I think not null is sufficient. So this will clearly fail because uh, we're not returning null. I mean, we are returning null. So now we can return a new receipt. This will pass, but this was a temporary test. I'm not going to leave that assertion the way it is. So now I expect it to pass. But really what I want to say is, um, what is it? Wh what do we want from our receipt? Well, one thing we want to ask it is, you know, what is, um, what's the total? And so this, we should be able to say, uh, this is equal. And so let's go create this, create the method. Uh, it's not a Boolean. It is a big decimal. And that's going to be is equal uh, to one. Is equal to one. Okay. This will fail. It'll be null, but that's fine. All right. And so now, <clears throat> um, now we want it to return one, which is the total. Except we, by the time we got to this line of code, we've already lost the total. So that means we need to extract this into a, vari a local variable, move it up. Now that was a refactoring, so the test should still fail in the same way, but nothing else should break. So that's fine. Uh, and now what we can say is we'll initialize it basically with total, maybe receipt as a record for now. Let's do that. Let's, let's turn it into a record. Um, so let's uh, let's say record, and it's a big decimal uh, total. I thought I was at eighteen. What happened? How do I get back to eight? That's why IntelliJ wasn't suggesting it. Okay. So, uh, this should now work because uh, we've got a receipt. It holds on to the total. We're passing the total here. And that should. Um, ugh. Why do I have two modules here? I think that's a. Um, yeah. Tell you, I think you're confused. Why did that get reset again? Hold on. Let's fix this. Oh. Oh, because I branched from main and main is still the wrong version. Right. Okay. That's why. So now we should be good.
Okay, great. All right. Let's go commit that. Um, Space Camp Foundation. Yes. Uh, mentioned that before, and uh, that's a product pricer issue, and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to deal with that pretty quickly, um, because I agree that is getting confusing. That's like, how do we know it's one? Yeah. Um, so I think after we we do this one, we'll want to to make our tests a bit more understandable. Um, and that uh, card service will need a reference that will force us to externalize the the product pricer. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm I might have want I might have might have should have perhaps I should have fixed that earlier. Um, but yeah. it's interesting because, you know, we went down the road when we started of only being concerned with the price of uh, basically the, how much the, the total price of items in the cart. If we had started with, I don't care what the prices are, I just want to know, are you keeping track of the items themselves? Um, might have gone in a different direction. And uh, the pricing might have, or might not have, it might not have helped us either way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so why does it think this is unused? Sure, it's used. It's used right. I think IntelliJ is a little... A little confused um so let's have it so now now we're now we're at a branching point um do we want to continue down the uh finalize order receipt having the contents of the cart which would force us to start storing the contents of the cart uh as they're added right that the products as they're added uh or do we want to take care of that product pricer. Um, I think I want to take care of the product pricer because that's going to cause a, a bunch of tests to have to be re reorganized. So um, we can... Let's do this through refactoring. This is a this is a trick I love. Um, so what we want is we want cart service to take product pricer uh, as a parameter to its constructor. What's sometimes known as dependency injection, but really it's we're passing in product pricer into cart service. Uh, so this gives us direct access to product pricer to make it more obvious, but also it will help us. Uh, so not, so it'll help us with tests, but it also is better better architecture. Now, you might just go ahead and say, all right, I'll go create a constructor and I'll create this as a parameter, but actually we can do, but then you have to change, um, uh, then you have to change a bunch of stuff manually. What I, what I try to do is as much as possible, because I love IntelliJ, um, is use the refactorings to, to get me there. Uh, hey, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, XIXI. Uh, you're saying the receipt is because the body's not used. It absolutely is used um, because it has an implicit method for for total. Uh, it's just confused because it doesn't know that it's there's some in, index that it's not fully updated. Um, so what we want to do is we want to say move initializer to constructor, and I realize that's slightly off screen. So let's do this. So what we want to do is move this new to the constructor. So that automatically created a, uh, our no argument constructor and did that there. No, no change, totally, totally refactoring. All our tests should, should continue to pass. But now what we can do is use one of my favorite refactorings, introduce parameter. And I would love to know why it keeps, oh, I know why I did that, okay. So what this will do is it'll push out, this is a parameter, and everywhere it's currently used, which is in all of my tests, it'll push new product pricer there.
right? So now, um, by the way, that just proved you wrong because now receipt, it updated, it updated some index. So now it knows where, how it's used. So it has nothing to do with the fact these, anything about curly braces or anything like that. It was that some index in IntelliJ didn't get updated and now it got updated. But by pushing this out as uh, an argument to cart service, first of all, all our tests should continue to pass. Second of all, that means now in all the tests, it just does the same thing. So now I can start creating custom modified interacting with the product pricer and all through automated refactorings. So again, it's one of my favorite techniques is like, you know, started out with something that was hidden, a hidden, uh, basically a hidden creation, a hidden dependency, a hidden collaborator. Um, and by refactoring to the constructor where w that's where it instantiates it and then pushing it as a parameter um, is a great way to, to, to do that without having to do a lot of manual work. So let's commit. Um, yeah, okay, so tests, so speaking of tests, yes, uh, IntelliJ uh, has this tendency, because stuff I tend to create through testing, it puts it in the wrong, in the wrong place. So let's do that. Let's fix that up. So thank you for noticing, because I often don't notice, and then I'm like, what, why can't I access this thing? Um, so let's move all these to the right place. Yeah, so cart, both cart service and product price were all in the test directory. Uh, so now that's right. So we got cart service, product price, and receipt. Oh, and that's probably why it didn't see receipt, because receipt was in... Um, Receipt was in the right place, but cart servers and product price were not. Even though they're technically in the same package, uh, it might have gotten confused. Although, it stopped being confused. Okay, so we got tests in the right place, and we got production code in the right place. Let's go commit. Uh, moved product code to the correct directory. Um, externalize the Tendency on product pricer, not pricer, pricer. All right, great. Um, I don't think we need to keep this open anymore. So, what we'd like is um, to now go back and, and change some of these tet tet tests uh and i can take out these comments now um we'd like this to be more obvious that it's going to be this so let's pull this out into a variable um and now what we'd like is we'd like to be able to initialize product pricer uh, to a specific item, but I want to drive that through uh, through a test, uh, through a failing test. Doesn't have to be a new test. So um, let's make up some other UPC. And we want this to be five. Um, this will fail because when it fi tries to find this product, it's not there. Uh, and right now we're assuming if it's not there, it's not worth anything. So this will be zero instead of five, right? So I'm predicting how this is going to fail to change to an existing test. Um, so do I like that? Or should I add another test? Because I, uh, let's, let's do this. Um, 
there's something about this that's, that's making me uncomfortable because uh, I feel like now I have to change the method, the test method name. Um, I don't like that. Let's let's undo that. I think maybe we refactor our way there. I don't know that we need any change in behavior. So let's do that. So let's pull, let's start with, let's start with this test. Um, but let's pull out the toothbrush UPC and the, and the one uh, and put that into there. So what we want is um, to push out uh, I want to push out the list. So in a sense, um, we're, ch we're changing behavior. Uh, I think this is too big of a jump. I think that's why I'm struggling. This is this is actually too big of a step. I think what we want to do is actually refactor our product pricer first, because right now it's just using if thens, and that's not going to be good for something that's sort of programmable. So let's let's undo that. But let's focus on refactoring our product pricer. Um, what we want to do is is. Uh, basically convert this we could replace it with a switch that's somewhat better um, but what we really want to do is is make it have state right really right now these are static files that kind of aren't state so um test still passes so that's fine so now this is a refactor, right? So we're expecting all our tests to continue to pass, but we're gonna make some code changes. We're actually gonna stuff these two things. Um, probably a map is the thing that makes the most sense. So uh, we'll create a map. Uh, and we're gonna map um, uh, string to, may as well, well, we'll do integer, but eventually we'll probably convert those to big decimal. Uh, product to price. Create our hash map. And so now we'll replace it. Um, I'm wondering how small a step do I want to take? Let's do this. Let's uh, just do toothbrush. So we comment that out. We expect now any test that involves toothbrush to fail. That's a bunch of them. How about we do it on toothpaste? That's better. So now we have a failing test. So let's um, make this test pass by doing product to price, uh, add, uh, sorry, put, uh, and so what we're going to put is the, basically this. And so, um, our default, I don't know if I want to do this. This might be, this might be too, too clever. Um, Let's just do this. Uh, if if product to price contains key UPC return product to price get uh, UPC uh, and then we gotta convert that to big decimal. Actually. In that case, we may as well just convert it to big decimal right off the bat. So 
this is a tiny step of starting to convert it to to a map um if this if this works uh if it's not in there then i'll fall through to this and then we'll eventually re re replace this so with this if this works this tells me that that i know how to use maps let's see if i know how to use maps okay apparently i do so let's do a commit so small step words converting uh switch to map lookup okay so now that we know that works now we can basically just grab this and do product to price put and then this oops And then we can delete both of these. <clears throat> this is an odd thing, but that's fine. So that still works. And now what I can do is I can basically unwrap the switch. Um, and since this is just a constant, I can now inline it here. And since this is just zero, I can uh, just make this be zero. Uh, yes, strip trailing zeros. That's interesting. I don't think I need to do that. So now this, this should still pass all my tests. But now I've converted it into a map. So that's kind of the first step, right? How did I get these things in here? Um, now, this still is encoded in terms of this information is encoded in here. Um, the goal of, of starting to external is, the goal of putting it in a map is to take then the next step of not only making it configurable, but then configurable from our tests. So what we want now is to push this out to somewhere else. So I can sort of, I could do the same technique of um, pushing the map outside of the product pricer. Um, or I could, uh, Yeah, I could push the, the map outside of it. So let's do that. Move the initializer to the constructor. Um, if I introduce that as a parameter, can I push out the, the contents of it? Actually, probably not. So I think I'll need to create uh, an overriding constructor because in production use, I won't, I'll, I'll be doing something different. I'm not sh quite sure what. Um, and this product pricer is actually kind of becoming, uh, right now it's actually a, not a real thing, even though it's in production code, it's not real because it's got fake pricing in it. So it's very much a stub. Um, So let's, so, uh, so the two directions I'm thinking at this point is one extract product pricer as, um, as an interface to be what's basically a port in the hexagonal architecture. Uh, and then this becomes a stub. Um, that's one direction. The other direction is to just make it a stub. No, I should do that. Let's let's do that. Okay. So let's go and we'll extract interface. Um, we're going to rename the original class because this implementation becomes a product pricer stub. Uh, and it actually moves to 
our test directory. Uh, so price for moves, because that's basically the, the method. Um, and I think that's it. Let's see what happens. Did it break anything? Yeah, so I kind of figured uh, some of the references to product price there, that didn't get updated. Um, that's fine. We'll just fix that up. All right, so let's let's commit uh, extracted product pricer interface with test level implementation. All right, cool. So now uh, in our test, it's a product pricer stub. Um, which is a, which is appropriate, and so now we can uh, we can start messing it with it without feeling like we're we're modifying production code. So again, our goal was to ex sort of make visible these hidden prices, right? So that way, because my goal when I'm uh, writing tests, whether it's test-driven development or not, my goal is writing tests is that you should be able to look at this test and know everything about why we're asserting what we're asserting. Right now, it's not evident why this is one. So what we want to do is we want to uh, make it clear that the product price or stub um, that we want to make it clear that it's sort of a programmable stub. So let's go back to our stub. I'm going to flip this over to there. Um, oops. So I think we could So it allowed me to, ex oh, because the put, what is that going to do? Yeah, that's not going to do what we want. Um, so let's push out this UPC. And so this is uh, a UPC. So how do we want to use the stubs? Uh, I think we want just the constructor to take pairs of UPC and price. So we'll do that. And then, um, Yeah, I may as well do that. And then, uh, so our goal is to get rid of these, basically these constants. So let's, um, Push this out and push this out. And I think we can basically re inline, uh, re inline, inline all basically turn these back into, into uh, the strings where they're used. Oops. And so now, um, if we look at our tests, so let's go and pull this out. Product pricer. Oops. I want to extract a variable, product pricer.
Uh, and so now, um, we could replace the strings with, with these constants, uh, but I think actually I'm going to inline it and then we'll recreate constants if we feel we need it. So now what we have is, let's do that, fix our formatting. So now we can go through test by test, right? All of our tests should still pass. So now we did this all through refactorings, right? So none of, so even though these are sort of structural changes, we we're able to do it um, mainly by pushing out these parameters to get the stuff into our test. And now we can play around with it from there. But now at least it's evident. We may have too much information. Right, so for example, cart total price at zero and is empty. Um, we're not adding products, so it doesn't matter what the product list is. So in fact, we could have an empty stub, uh, but we'll need to have a constructor that handles that. So we'll have to fix that. But right now, since everything passes, right, we'll do a commit. Uh, so um, pushed out configuration of product price or stub. Uh, to callers. Now we can start cleaning up the test. Like, so here, this first test, I don't need anything. I just need an empty stub. In fact, it almost should be not used at all. Um, so I could replace this stub with a dummy. So null is, is okay as a dummy, um, not great, but it, this test should still pass because it we never call add products if the product price is not used. But what I'd really like is I'd like um, a product price or stub that, that basically starts out as empty. So let's do new product price or stub. And we'll create an additional constructor. And so here, um, we'll sort of reinitialize it back here and take this out. And so now this is a NoArg constructor with really doing nothing. All right, so created no arg vector for product right through stub. So that took care of that test. This test, all we care about is this. So we don't need this product. So we can take this out, except um, product price or stub requires uh, four items. Uh, we could convert to var args, um, but then we'd have to sort of pair these up and that gets kind of awkward. Uh, so although it does mean it does, it is interesting because there is a code smell of like, these are some kind of parameter object, right? This is actually like product, a product class, which is when I did TDD, inside out, I ended up with a product class and it looks like I might end up with that here. Um, well, that's kind of too big of a change at this point. I'm just refactoring. So I'm going to just create another constructor that takes just a single UPC and its price. And I know basically the test, uh, should still pass, um, and it does. So created single product item constructor. So now this test is self-contained in the in terms of the information that it has, right? We've got one, two, three here, uh, and one, two, three here. And so we could extract this back out to constant if we wanted.
maybe red crit uh spock tests um i'm not a spock test fan i, I like j unit And nothing against it. I'm, um, I'm just an old Java guy, and that's all I know. All right. So here, this test actually uses both, um, both items and both prices. So let's go and pull this out. Uh, let's pull this out into the other, which is tooth paste UPC. Uh, and that's fine. And then now this is redundant. So let's um, extract this to a method. Um, although if we do that, that again hides the, the values. Uh, so let's let's leave it. I'm actually not terribly upset about that so this one um again doesn't need the uh the other item so we can leave it like that so so now we've achieved our goal right all through just refactorings of these tests are now self-contained, right? You know why this is three, because the three here matches the three here. You know why this is one plus three, because it matches these here. Maybe I want to... Um, I want to swap these. Ah! Now I want to swap them. That way I get the order of toothbrush, toothpaste. Here we know it's one, and here we know it's, it's empty. So let's look at our other tests. Um, place order test. So here again, the same thing. Uh, here again, we don't need this product. And don't need, oops. Right now we only need one product. And so we can extract this out. All our tests should continue to pass. Uh, do you try BDD way uh, tests like JUnit? Um, so I have an, this in, in all of my tests, there's sort of an implicit given when then, right? So like this test here, given a product pricer that has these prices uh, and a cart service, when I add, so given that a product has been added to the cart, when I finalize the order, then the receipt total should be one. All right, so all of my tests have those three parts, whether they're BDD tests or TDD, because it's a spectrum of just what level of abstraction, what level, what layer of boundary are you working at. Um, could also use, you know, Cucumber, Gherkin language for, for some of that. I don't, I'm not crazy about it. Um, I just don't do enough at that level. And so I tend to write all my tests using JUnit, even if they're more BDD-like. All right, so let's commit. Uh, so we finish cleaning up that test. Um, special deals test is not ready yet. Uh, we'll just leave it. All right. So we've separated out Product pricer, we actually don't have a concrete real implementation uh, and we might not have one for a little while. Um, but now at least our tests are readable in isolation uh, and that's what that's what we want. So um, 
let's go back to our receipt. Let's now uh, get to the point where we can actually have multiple products in our receipt. So we're keeping track of the products. So we want to expand this test where the receipt is not only returning uh, the total, but also we want the receipt to have um, items, products, products, contents, products, products. Yeah, I guess I'm not too concerned about pretty formatting in, in tests. Um, but it, again, depends on how your, your team or, or organization is structured, uh, how useful useful that is. So um, products doesn't actually require a separate method. It is basically just uh, a list of something. We can start off with string. Uh, and that should contain exactly um, so I think right now the only information we have uh, is the UPC we don't actually have the name of the product um, that's actually what we'll probably use uh, the external service for all right, so I mentioned way back hours ago um, that I have this, actually let me, uh, that there's a, a third party service where I can give it a UPC and it gives me all sorts of information about the product. Um, so I can use that to give me, to for us to fetch the names uh, as, as we need it. So maybe a, a fancier receipt. It can also give us categorization. So I don't know about where you shop, but where I shop, um, often the receipts that I get uh, at the grocery store are organized in, in ca into categories. You know, here's your dairy, uh, here's your meat, here's your produce, um, etc. And so, uh, obviously, that's not the way you scanned it, but it uh, obviously kept it and then categorized it according to whatever taxonomy they're using. So we could use that as well. But for now, uh, we'll just use that. Um, in fact, let's pull this out into constant. So uh, clearly this will fail because products is going to, in fact, it won't even compile because over here, um, we don't have anything. So let's do the minimum we get do to get it to compile. We'll just say empty list. Uh, collections empty list? That's weird. Don't know why it didn't expand empty list for me. So now this will fail because it's going to be empty instead of containing our product. Awesome. Fails exactly the way we expect it. Uh, now, we um, uh, we can start down the TDD road of, of sort of zero, one, many. So we had the zero case, right? Finalize order. Um, we could have examined the receipt as well. Um, and so maybe we'll, we'll step back and do that. So let's, now that we know we're sort of in the zero one mini case, let's start out with, with the zero case. So, um, part with, uh, no products, finalize order. Well, actually, what do we want to happen if we finalize the order and no products were added? Maybe that's not valid. So 
So we can't actually do the zero case. Yeah, we have to do the exception case. Well, that's part of zombies. The Z-O-M-B-I, so boundary conditions and exception of cases. Uh, so cart with no products, finalize order, throws exception. So we're saying that if we, um, uh, We'll do that. Um, we can actually have an empty stop because we don't care about the product pricing. Uh, we basically finalize the order. Um, uh, oh, do I have not? Don't, I don't have my post fix. There we go. So we're going to say, what is this? Um, this is an instance of uh, card is empty exception no products in our exception and uh, right now it's there uh, I'm gonna say extends runtime exception and we'll override these two. Oh, yeah, I guess I could do that. Uh, yes, I did surround it with a third that thrown by. You did not miss anything. Um, so I have in my post fit my surround templates. Uh, so I can basically like select it use um, a custom template so i have a uh, surround with a cert that thrown by uh, and it'll do the right thing uh, so you want templates not that so these are live templates as opposed to dead templates but um so i have a bunch uh that i've customized so um if i just do att it'll it'll expand um but there are also surround ones uh over here that you can customize so i've got uh i can surround with assert that i can surround with assert that thrown by so it takes whatever your selection is sticks it in there fills in the rest uh and then leaves you to define an exception here so post fix uh live templates um are ways you can customize uh things to make them to make intelligent much more fun uh, i thought i had a post fix where i could do dot attdb um because i have the latest production on three different lines plus the early access i've got four different ones and sometimes it's hard to copy configuration across all right, so we got this test. This will most certainly fail because we're not throwing an exception at all. So fails as expected. Oops. So let's go to finalize order. Um, so we're going to do the simplest thing we could do to make that work, which is if, uh, if it's empty, then we'll throw a new... Uh, no products in cart exception. No. Uh, did... Darn it, the exception got put in the wrong place. Hold on. This is in the wrong directory. I keep forgetting to check that when it creates it. Let's try it again. Throw new, uh, no products in cart exception. All right, so this should make the test pass. Yeah, at some point, I, uh, so I base so in my Discord, I do have a dedicated channel to IntelliJ. Uh, so if you need help with any of the file template stuff or anything like that, uh, go ahead and ask in, in that channel. All right, so this test passes. Um, and I wish it were a bit easier to share some of those things with sort of like friends and neighbors, as it were. Um, but all right, this test passes. Um, finalizing order with no. Uh, finalizing order for empty cart throws exception. Uh, let's see, you know, 
Let's wait for product list. All right. So then that's our zero case, which is basically it's invalid. So now we've got our one case, which should still fail. Oh, I didn't refactor. Hold on. Uh, let's refactor. This is uh, require part not empty. There we go. All right, now this fails. Um, so let's go ahead and, and remember the last item added. Uh, so basically, go ahead and create this variable field. Um, that was basically a refactoring of sort. Not really. I mean, I mean, it didn't affect behavior, so you could say it's a refactoring, but it didn't quite get us towards where we need to go. Um, but now we can basically change this. And we can say list of UPC. This should pass. And it does. So now we can uh, go to multiple. So cart with two products, finalize order, returns receipt, all products. So I'm going to go grab um, something from here. And the fact that I'm copying this from here is signaling to me that I might want to refactor the creation of this stuff. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. Okay. So we add that and we add, I guess I could have just added the toothbrush twice, but that might be unclear about what my expectations are. So here it contains exactly that and toothpaste. Um, the total is four, so I could say one plus three. Uh, so this will pass because it holds things up correctly. Uh, this will fail because it's only going to store the last item. So when I predict that this will fails, um, I'm predicting exact, exact specifically that the toothbrush will not be there anymore. So the toothbrush is missing. And it is, because the toothbrush is what again? Honestly, these are strings. I could just replace them with a name. But I want to sort of keep this idea that, that they're a number. OK. So now, clearly, storing just a single item is not going to work. Uh, so we can do this as a prepare refactoring. All right. Get back to passing tests. and transform this from a string to a list of string. And then this becomes uh, products.add. And then this is just products. And this we have to say is new array list. This was just a refactoring, the fact that we're storing an item and only one item in the list. Um, it does actually slightly change behavior. Um, so in a sense, this is not quite a refactoring because we've expanded, we've, gener we've actually generalized this. Uh, we could, if we wanted to be precise about this, instead of doing that here, we could do that um, 
here. That still passes, but it doesn't generalize the behavior around holding on multiple items. Because what I want is I want this test to still fail. Because that proves that the code that I'm about to change or add actually is being tested and exercised by a test. So I've seen this now fail. Now I can go generalize this uh, with a refactor, and now it should pass. And it does. So there's some refactoring that I'd like to do. Um, this is a little yucky. Um, there's a lot of different things going on here. Uh, we could say this resets cart, um, but if I refactor that to that, uh, it actually isn't going to take me towards where I want to go, um, which is basically going to be to, to have a cart object in, in our domain. But what we have now is we've got um, in our application, so receipt is really a domain concept. So it's currently an application, but actually it doesn't belong there. So let's let's take that and let's move it. Um, it's like it's a value object, but it belongs in our domain. So let's go ahead and move that. So it goes in domain. Um, product pricer is a port. It's an outgoing thing, right? It's right now. It's in. We, we don't have an actual implementation, but from a hexagonal architecture, uh, it's an external thing. So we'd want it to go through um, an adapter. So in fact, we wouldn't directly talk to it. Uh, we would actually talk through, through a port. Let's see. Ah, that's how I change it. Okay. Uh, so let's do that color. Okay. So there would be um, a port here. So this is our outgoing port. Um, and then we would have, uh, let's go and move that. So we'd have an outbound adapter um, that can go fetch basically our uh, price fetcher or pricer uh, would go and use that service. But inside of our hexagon, uh, it has no knowledge of the specific implementation that we would eventually use. So that means product pricer, the interface, because ports are interfaces. Uh, would actually go, um, it's part of application, but I tend to segregate these outgoing ports into a directory called port. Cart service is application, although it's still this messy hybrid of things. Um, no products in cart exception. Uh, so that happens when we finalize. It's unclear right now, is that application level or is that domain level? Um, since I don't know, I'll, I'll leave it in application. Uh, eventually, we will have a cart object. We will likely also have a product object of some sort, uh, and that will go in, in our domain. 
So let's go ahead and do a commit. Um, refactored packaging according to hexagonal architecture. So that's all for today. Um, tomorrow, uh, when am I streaming next? Not tomorrow, because I am busy tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday. Yeah, so Wednesday I'll probably stream part two of, of doing the hexagonal architecture. Um, we uh, can probably get now to um, the special deals. Because right, this required us to have uh, sort of knowledge and memory of multiple items um, and uh, sort of the history of, of what items were added. And now that we have that, uh, at least in a very limited way, we can now uh, start uh, focusing on that. And then we'll um, probably uh, go implement the... Uh, the product pricer. We won't use it to get pricing per se. Um, we'll use it to get information and sort of enrich the receipt uh, with product information. Because right now all we've got is UPCs and uh, we can call out to the API and get names and, and categories and then uh, do some interesting stuff with, uh, with that. So that'll be sort of the first part of implementing something external to what's really our, our sort of core application, which is in here. Um, and then we'll uh, create a sort of tester web interface. Um, although I guess we could do it as a console, but, but I'll, um, we'll bring in Spring Boot for this. And we'll um, create a, you know, sort of, um, actually maybe we'll just use, do an API. Uh, so um, that way we can actually do it from, from within IntelliJ, use its uh, HTTP um, message uh, requester sender kind of thing. Uh, so we can do everything inside there. So we'll create a REST, uh, a REST-like API um, as as our adapter, uh, and then uh, that'll uh, I think that that'll be a, a good next step. All right. So thank you so much for hanging out, um, and thanks again. Uh, uh, To all the folks who um, who subscribed and, and thanks to JetBrains, I'm, I'm, they're long gone uh, for the the ten subs. That was that was awesome. Um, and uh, who else? Um, whoops. Sorry. Why is that not working? Where is my stream manager? Oh, they changed the UI. That's so weird. Um, uh, oh, and to 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 Katamalia for for bringing over the awesome set of folks who and some of which who who hung out until now. So, uh, so thanks so much. Um,